chapters. Um, John chapter 10 has more theology packed into it than any other section in the Gospel of John. That's pretty interesting. And, and, and I tell you that because this is the famous chapter where Jesus states, I am the door and I am the good shepherd. And we're going to handle both of those uh, this morning. I um, mean, if you think about it, this chapter, John chapter 10, is the heart and soul of every Sunday school curriculum that was ever written, right? I mean, just, just uh, the mention of Jesus as the good shepherd brings back memories of cutting out sheep, right? And then getting those cotton balls with the Elmer's glue and putting it on. Do you guys remember doing this? And then you're putting it on the sheep, and that's kind of boring. And then you look over, and you see the kid next to you, and you think, they need a cotton ball stuck to them as well, right? And then you start, and then you get in trouble. Now that's probably, but, but, but that's the beauty of this chapter, right? That's what makes it so awesome is it's packed full of theological truth, but it's also written in such a way that a child can understand it and be blessed by it. So let's read John chapter 10, and we're going to read verses 1 to 6 just to get us started off this morning. John chapter 10, verses 1 to 6. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they did not know the voice of strangers. And Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help us during this time as we study his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today, and we thank you for your goodness to us, and we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful weather. Uh, The sun is out, it's shining. Um, Everything just looks so uh, wonderful and beautiful. And Lord, when we look at your creation and we we see the sun like that, we, we realize it is a reflection of who you are, your, your beauty, your creativity, uh, uh, your majesty, your strength. And Lord, we just thank you for that. We thank you that you are the unchanging God that never wavers and that we can always rely on you. And so when we see the beauty of your creation, as I did as we drove down here, Lord, um, we thank you for your attributes and for um, how you care about us and how you created something for us to enjoy. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for your love. Uh, Lord, as we study this passage this morning, I pray, Lord, that um, we, we would uh, listen with understanding hearts, that we would take it and apply it to our lives in a way that would be pleasing to you so that we would become more like Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help me, that I would have a calm heart and that I have clarity of thought as I speak these words. And Lord, help me to only speak the words that you would have me speak. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. When Jesus gave this, I am the door and I am the good shepherd teaching, the Jews that he was addressing should have known what he was talking about. Uh, The imagery of, of, of the door and the shepherd was not a new concept to them, right? I think about Psalm 23 as an example, and I'm going to read it to you. And think about it if you were a Jewish person. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? Amen. How many of you enjoyed hearing that? And we enjoy it, right? Because we as Christians, we, we think that we own Psalm 23. <laughs> it's one of our favorite psalms. You probably could quote most of it if you grew up in church or went to Sunday school, right? And, and in a lot of ways, Psalm 23 does belong to us. But we can't forget that Psalm 23 actually first belonged to the Jews. And, and, and Psalm 23 was as meaningful and as special to them as it is to us. 
In fact, you might say that it was more meaningful and special to them than it is to us. Because after all, they understood the imagery, didn't they? Uh, They saw the shepherd and the sheep all around them every day. Now think about it. When was the last time that you saw a shepherd tending to his sheep um, on the hills? I just drove down from Reading, Pennsylvania. I did not see any shepherds. I did not see any sheep. I saw a lot of beautiful mountains and and trees and a lot of trees, um, but no shepherd and sheep. Um, And and I'm not talking about maybe seeing, if if you've been traveling out in the country, even maybe seeing a shepherd on a distant hillside. That would happen in South Africa. We'd every now now and then see a shepherd like that. Um, But it's not something that we see very often in our culture, in our country, this day and age, um, to see an actual shepherd caring for a sheep. Um, For most of us, when we think about it, it's something that we've seen on television, right? Or maybe we've seen the picture of it in a book. Rarely do we see it in person. Well, the Jews, they saw it every day. They got out of their houses. They're going off to work. They were like walking in between sheep trying to get to work. That was what they dealt with every day. They literally lived it. And so when Jesus starts using his terminology in John chapter 10, the Jews, they should have understood what he was talking about. Uh, Maybe what threw them off was the little twist that he puts in there where he talks not only about the true shepherd that will care for the sheep, but he also mentions there that there are false shepherds who came only to steal, right? So maybe that's what put them off. But really, that really shouldn't have put them off either as well. They should have understood exactly what he was talking about because back in Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 6, the prophet Jeremiah, whom they loved and knew well, this is what he had to say. My people have become lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. They have made them turn aside on the mountains. They have gone along from mountain to hill, and they have forgotten their resting place. So Jeremiah talked about it. They studied Jeremiah. And then Ezekiel also had something to say about it in Ezekiel chapter 34, where God said to Israel, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day, when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they are scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel. Oh boy, there are so many sermons right there. I could just tell you about the great hope that we have as believers and this is already in action. Uh, the, 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 The nation of Israel, God has already started collecting the Israelites together at the nation of Israel and one day he will Uh, save his people. You'll see it. Um, Maybe if pastor lets me come and preach another time, I'll do a series on Revelation and show you what that's all about. It's so exciting. I digress. Sorry, I got really excited there. (laughs) All right, I'll read verse 13 again. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, and strengthen the sick. They knew about this passage. The Israelites, the Jews, they knew this. This is exactly what Israel was looking for the Messiah to do. He was going to be the great shepherd that would rescue God's people. He would bring them from out of the nations and he would pastor them on the mountains of Israel. The Messiah would step into the role of King David and sit on his throne and he would be the great shepherd of the sheep. That was the great hope of the Jews during Jesus' time. They knew these passages well as they were sitting there under Roman occupation and and being oppressed by the Romans. They were looking for the Messiah. They knew these passages. So keeping all this in mind, what Jesus is saying here and and what what the Jews should have understood but they didn't was that there is only one good shepherd and, and the rest are false shepherds. As a matter of fact, the rest are thieves and robbers, he says. Now, in our postmodern world, that kind of statement makes people very uncomfortable. I had an experience of postmodernism yesterday, last night, 
we went to the Reading Symphony Orchestra. We had free tickets to go to it. We were sitting, sitting on the second row. By the way, if you ever go to a symphony orchestra, don't sit on the second row. You can't see anything. You only see the first people that are playing, and then you can't see behind them. So try and get the cheaper seats because there's a better. But anyway, I digress. And they had this amazing orchestra, and they were playing Mozart, and it was just beautiful. And then they played, and I can't remember the guy's name, some German dude, started with an S. Um, he composed something. He passed away in 1998, so he's pretty new. And what, he, what they were playing was a postmodern style of orchestra music. I, I would go over here and do it, but you wouldn't like it. But have you ever seen a, 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 a kid, uh, maybe a, 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 a toddler, take their fist and pound on the piano keys? I'm not joking you. That's what went on for about 20 minutes. And we're all like thinking, oh, this is just the beginning. Then they're going to break into a nice melodic type situation. No? And these people, I told Heidi, I said, I was quite impressed with these pianists because I'm pretty sure you would have to read the music to be able to do what they were doing. It was that bad. I mean, it was just brutal. Um, postmodernism. Um, postmodern, they were challenging the fact that does something really have to have a melody? What, does something have to sound beautiful? What is beauty? So they were exploring what beauty was. I was like, well, you figured out what isn't pretty. I tell you that much. <laughs> it's not that. Everyone was just kind of like, whoa, what did I just hear? Postmodernism believes that there is no such thing as absolutes. There is no absolute truth. There is no absolute wrong. Uh, it, it's all depending on your opinion. And the statement that Jesus makes here that he is the only one good shepherd and the rest are false, sh false shepherds. Um, in our postmodern world, that, that is an absolute statement that our world hates. They don't like statements like that that Jesus makes in the Bible. Jesus is saying here that he is the only one good shepherd. He is the only one Messiah. The rest are thieves and robbers. And, and, and people do. They get all bent out of shape when they come across these things, or if you take this position when you're witnessing to someone, they don't like to hear it because they don't believe in absolutes. To them, every religious person is a good shepherd, and you just need to find the one that works best for you, right? There are many ways to heaven, just you need to find the one that best agrees with you. You need to follow that way. Is that what God says here? Is that what Jesus was saying here? No. Jesus disagrees with them. And he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up by some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So now there's a couple of things that we need to understand in Jesus' illustration or in the picture that he's drawing here. The sheepfold represents Israel, and there is a defined, prescribed, and predetermined way through which the Messiah must enter the door of the sheepfold, okay? And, and this defined, prescribed, and predetermined doorway is referring to the messianic prophecies that we have, that we are given there in the Old Testament, that the Messiah had to fulfill at his coming. You see, God didn't want Israel to be in the dark concerning when the Messiah arrived. He wanted them to know he's here. And so he gave literally the hundreds of these prophecies that define the Messiah has to fulfill all these prophecies. And so here's the doorway. And the doorway represents, you can't go through this doorway unless you fulfill all the prophecies. All of them. That's the, and, and, and so there's only one person that can get to that doorway. And when that person gets to that doorway, then you'll know that that's the Messiah. All right? He did not want the Messiah's coming to be shrouded in mystery. God wanted the doorway to be so well defined, prescribed, and predetermined that when he stepped through that doorway, everyone would know without a question. So let me give you an example of how well this doorway was defined, okay? Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. It was prophesied the Messiah would be from the tribe of Judah. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it was prophesied that Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, the Messiah would be heir to the King David's throne. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, Messiah would minister in Galilee. Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, Messiah would preach the gospel 
to the poor. Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6, Messiah would heal the blind, deaf, and lame. And then Isaiah 53, verses 5 to 12, Messiah would be the sacrifice for sin. I just gave you seven Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah, who he would be, what he would do, where he would come from. Just seven. There's literally hundreds of them. So I'd say that's a pretty well-defined, prescribed, and predetermined doorway, right, through which the Messiah had to walk through. And can you think of anyone other than Jesus that would be able to walk through that doorway? You know, when the Apostle Paul was going around and he was uh, preaching in the synagogues, did you know that's what he was doing? That's what he was sharing with those Jews in the synagogues? They didn't have the New Testament. He took them to the Old Testament. He was showing them, look at all these verses in the Old Testament. Jesus was the Messiah. You need to put your faith in him. Of course, they, many of them rejected it. And it's also interesting, when Jesus made this statement, in the 50 years before Jesus came, there were many who came and pretended to be the Messiah. Um, but they did not come in by the door. They, they tried to climb in some other way. Um, because all these other guys who were these fake messiahs, um, why? Well, they fell short of the requirements, and, and they were ultimately proven to be fakes. And you can learn about these guys in Josephus' writings and other historical writings, and every now and then you'll get some crazy person that says he's the messiah, um, and you're like, okay, you know, whatever. But they had it back in Jesus' day as well. And there is only one who has entered through the prescribed doorway, and that is Jesus, and he is the true shepherd of the sheep. Now, let's think about these thieves and robbers who try to enter into the sheepfold without going through the prescribed doorway because they can't. Uh, there are typically people who will claim to speak f for God. Have you, have you seen this? You see it on TV or the radio a lot. Uh, they'll have a word from the Lord. No one else had this, just, just them. I've had this word of the Lord, and you, you needed to listen to them. Um, they'll, they'll, they'll claim to understand the things of God better than anybody else, uh, and so you need to listen to them. Notice that, that Jesus does not describe these people as just being unenlightened or, or misinformed or, or slightly mistaken. No, that, that's not how he describes them. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He describes them as thieves and robbers, which again is not politically correct, right? We're not supposed to say such harsh things about people. Well, Jesus did. He called it as he, as he saw it. And they're described as thieves and robbers. So, so what has this got to do with us today? Well, what I'm trying to tell you is there are a lot of bad guys out there that are under the umbrella of Christianity. And you need to watch out for these guys. And, and I believe that some of these guys are sin sincere. They are sincere. And they're well-meaning. But... In the final analysis, they rob people of their relationship with God. They, they steal away true spirituality. They, they are sincere, but sincerity doesn't make you right. They're just sincerely wrong, all right? There are others out there that aren't sincere, and they're not well-meaning, and they're basically wolves in shepherd's clothing, aren't they? And, 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 and they're basically out there to rip people off specifically to rip off God's people. They care nothing about people's souls. They, they care nothing about people's spiritual well-being. They, they only care about profit and power, and they want more and more and more of it. I'm not going to name names, but just turn on your television. You'll see it. You'll find them if you look long enough. Now make no mistake, these wolves, they're racking it in. All right? And what Jesus is saying here is don't get ripped off. The true shepherd will enter the sheepfold through the prescribed door. The ones who come over the wall, well, they're thieves and robbers, and you should have nothing to do with them. Now, let's give you an example of how this works in our day and age. There, there are some, and I, I, and I apologize. If I'm going to step on some toes today, I apologize. I'm, I'm leaving in about an hour, and it'll be okay. Um, but there are some, you need to know this, especially in this area. There are some that teach that Mary is the co-redeemer along with Jesus. And I believe many of the people who teach this are well-meaning. Uh, I'm not trying to be mean to them. But they teach that Mary is the co-redeemer along with Jesus. Basically, they believe that Jesus can save you just like Mary. Um, sorry, that Mary can save you just like Jesus can. That's what they believe. Um, but the question is, did Mary fulfill all the prophecies that the Messiah had to fulfill? Could Mary walk through that door? 
Now, in a unique way, she did play a part in Jesus fulfilling some of those prophecies, right? But she never fulfilled any of those prophecies herself. And what's interesting is they try to ascribe to Mary attributes that will make up for this. So they'll say things, well, she remained a virgin. Uh, They'll say that she lived without sin. Um, But the fact of the matter is, none of it is true. None of it is based on scripture. Um, It's just stuff they made up. And they're misleading people with it. And again, it never makes up for the fact that Mary never walked through the prescribed door. There was only one who could. And that is who we sung about this morning in a wonderful song about Jesus. It was him. So what does that mean? Those that portray her as co-redeemer are what? I'm sorry, Jesus is the one that said it, not me. They're thieves and robbers. Now, you can use all the prophecies uh, that the Messiah had to fulfill, and if you're smart, you'll use it as a litmus test. You'll test to see whether the Jesus of the various cults and religions that we have out there is the Jesus of the Bible, is the true Jesus, the the Messiah. Um, The Jesus of the Roman Catholics, right? The the Jesus of the Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons, the, the Jesus of the New Age movement. Their Jesus can't fit through the door. Um, because there are very important aspects about the Messiah that they leave out or they won't give to him. And that's why it's important that you understand what God's definition is of who the Messiah would be. Because he's the one we're placing our faith in, amen? He's the one that died on the cross for our sins. Better get it right. And we can get it right because God's made it so obvious. There is no question and so that's why it's important that we understand these prophecies. We, ha- we have to understand the prophecies in the Old Testament so we know what the door was, so we're not fooled by these fake messiahs that, that are all around about us that the cults and false religions push uh, on television, radio, and everywhere else. Um, you don't want the Catholic Church's idea of what the messiah is. You don't want the Jehovah Witnesses or the, or the Mormons or the New Age Movement's idea of who the Messiah would be. Um, you want God's truth. Um, you see, the true shepherd enters through the door. What do these false shepherds do? They try to climb in some other way, right? Well, Jesus then says, it is to this true shepherd that the gatekeeper opens the door. That's pretty interesting. And to understand this passage properly, we have to understand that there are two different types of sheepfolds that were used in that day. And, and the one that Jesus is referring to here in verse 3 was the communal sheepfold. And it would be used um, really more in populated areas, very close to the towns and to the cities. The communal sheepfold. The other kind of sheepfold would be a private sheepfold. And that's where the shepherd would be far away from the town or from the city couldn't come back in time so by, by nighttime, so he would build his own little sheepfold there in the countryside on the hills. Um, so the way that the communal sheepfold works, and that's the one that Jesus is referring to here, um, it, it was usually close to, say, like a town or a city like Bethlehem, uh, and there would have been a lot of shepherds that had been grazing um, their sheep on, on, on the hills, and then it would start to become nighttime, evening, and so they would bring their sheep in together, and they would all go into this one very large communal um, sheepfold. And um, so it, it was pretty interesting. These, these communal sheepfolds, they were usually made out of stone. They were usually about nine to ten feet high, and they all only had one door. So there was just one way to get in, and it was through this door. And, and the door would be guarded by a gatekeeper. And his job basically was to keep the predators out and to let only the true shepherds in the ones whose sheep were in the sheepfold. And so who was the gatekeeper that recognized the true shepherd? Who's the gatekeeper that that Jesus is talking about here? Well, the gatekeeper was John the Baptist. It was prophesied that it would be John the Baptist. He was the voice that was crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Remember that passage? Um, He was the herald that came before the Messiah to prepare the hearts of men and women. He was the one who who came to break up the stony ground so that men and women would be ready to receive the Messiah. 
That's what John the Baptist did. John was also the one who introduced the Messiah to Israel. Do you remember how he did it? He was there in the Jordan River and he points to Jesus and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Awesome, hey? John the Baptist was the forerunner of the Messiah. No other Messiah has a forerunner except Jesus. It was John the Baptist. And John the Baptist's ministry was the fulfillment of the prophecy that was prophesied all the way back in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 and 4. Another proof that Jesus was the true shepherd. There should never be any doubt in your mind. All right. Then once the door is opened, our passage tells us that the sheep, they hear Jesus' voice, right? And he calls his sheep by name. And, and what Jesus is doing here is he's putting an emphasis on the spoken word of the shepherd. Uh, as the shepherd spoke to the sheep, those sheep that recognize his voice would follow him and they would not follow the voice of a stranger. You know, it's an amazing picture, isn't it? Uh, Jesus doesn't have to go into this communal sheepfold and kind of gather up all his sheep. Oh, that one got away. Come here, come here, come here. Have you ever done that before like with your dogs or cats or little piglets or whatever? It, it's a nightmare. That's not what Jesus had to do. All he has to do, the gatekeeper opens the door and he calls his sheep by name. The sheep recognize his call and he leads them out. It's pretty amazing. You know, I was thinking about this whole call thing and I was thinking about cats and dogs. You know, and um, is there anything that's more humiliating and frustrating than calling a cat? You know, you step out of the door, you're like, cat, come here. You know the cat can see you. You know the cat can hear you. The cat's like, whatever, man, I'm busy, right? A dog, now I grew up um, having dogs my whole life. I love dogs. We don't have a dog right now. It's so hard not having a dog, but I don't have a yard, so don't have a dog. But um, in South Africa, we had a dog for protection, and his name was Trooper, and he was a Rhodesian Ridgeback. And Rhodesian Ridgebacks are larger, a little bit smaller than a Great Dane, and they have been bred to hunt lions. So you can see why he kept our family safe because everything else is weaker than a lion, right? Um, so his name was Trooper, and I'd go out into, in the morning and say, hey, Trooper, come here, Trooper, Trooper. And you could hear him coming like a horse galloping. <laughs> and you could see his face, Ridgeback smile, by the way, in case you don't know that, they do smile. They have this amazing, cute little smile. And his tongue's this, and he's just coming full speed. And then I realize I'm in trouble because there's no way that dog can slow down in time. And sure enough, he comes flying into me, smack, almost every time his whole life, he would almost knock me over. He was just so excited, couldn't wait to see me. He had heard my voice. Nothing was going to stop that dog from coming to me. All right, well, that's the case with these sheep that Jesus is calling, right? They hear their shepherd's voice. And they come, maybe not gleefully like, like Trooper, but they come nonetheless, right? Um, there's, a, there's a few hundred sheep in that sheep pen. Remember, it's a communal sheep pen, and those that are his come out. And essentially what Jesus is saying to this group of Jews that are, that are listening to him is that he had not come to work within their religious worldly systems. That's not why he had come. Uh, he was not coming to work with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Rather, he had come as a good shepherd to free his sheep from those evil systems, from those false shepherds, because there was no life in them, and he had come to pull them out of it. Jesus was the good shepherd, and he was going to lead his sheep where they ought to go. And another thing that Jesus was explaining in this parable was why some in the nation of Israel had responded to his word and left Judaism, and why others hadn't and stayed with Judaism and those that had stayed they stayed because they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah and those that did follow him they followed him because they believed God's word and they recognized he is the Messiah and so in a way this parable is explaining to you why Israel and why Jews to this day still reject Jesus as the Messiah all right because they don't believe in him they heard his word, and they decided what Jesus was saying was false. And so effectively, what they did was they turned away from him. But at the end of the day, their rejection did not show that his word is false. 
what their rejection is showing is that they were not his sheep. Does that make sense? Because they've heard his call, and they're like, I don't hear it. I'm not coming. All right. So Jesus is explaining all this stuff to them, and in verse 6 he tells us, they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. And I've already shown you how they should have. They should have. But they were refusing to listen. But that doesn't stop Jesus, amen? So he puts it to them in another way. Look at what Jesus says in verses 7 to 10. Then Jesus says to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And whoever comes, whoever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come expect to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So, to really understand this passage, you have to understand that Jesus is now doing a little switcheroo here. He is now switching the illustration from him being the shepherd to where he is now the door of the sheepfold. Okay, so he was a shepherd, now he's the door, and Jesus also switches the sheepfolds on us, all right? So we're going to take a look at that in just a second. Now, I know this is a long sermon, and I'm really sorry. So what we're going to do is we're going to stand up and say hi to the guy in behind us and kind of stretch our legs a little bit. Is that okay, Pastor? if we can do that. And I'll give you about one minute to kind of walk around. You can do jumping jacks if you want to. And then we'll come back and finish the rest of the sermon. So we'll take a one minute break. Okay. Ready, set, go. Take a break. I'm serious. You can... (laughs) Enough Christian love. Let's get together and uh, um, let's get started again. Um... We're carrying on here. Um, we're, we're now at the point where Jesus is switching the illustration, right? Uh, where he was the shepherd. Now he is the door of the sheepfold. And he's now switching sheepfolds on us. And remember, we talked about how there are two different types of sheepfolds in Jesus' day. The communal sheepfold, which was pictured in verse 3. Um, and that housed a number of flocks from um, the shepherds there. And then we have the private sheepfold, um, where the shepherd would build this for his sheep, on his own, just for his own sheep, and it would typically be because he was way out in the hills. And so this is the, this private sheepfold is now what Jesus is referring to here. Um, and so typically how it would work is during the summer months, things are a little bit drier in Israel, and so you, as a shepherd, you have to go farther and farther out to find fields where you can uh, have your sheep graze, and so um, to find pasture. And so uh, you wouldn't be able to get back to town in time because you would literally be two or three days journey out. And so they would build a temporary sheepfold. Usually it would be, it's pretty small actually, I'd say 21 feet by um, maybe 12 feet. It was small depending on how many sheep the person would have, the shepherd would have. And they'd build the frame out of sticks and, and tree limbs and then they would fill in all the gaps with these thorny bushes that you can find all over Israel. And it really made a a perfect wall. It would keep pretty much anything out. They were really good at it. But the one thing that's different about the the um, uh, the private sheepfold is that it didn't have a gate like the like the communal one. There was no gate. There was just this opening that allowed one opening that allowed the sheep to go in and out. And there's this classic story about this Old Testament scholar. His name was Doctor George Smith and. Uh, I believe this was, if I'm not mistaken, sometime right before the First World War, and he was traveling through Israel, and he was checking things out, and uh, um, he, he came across uh, one of these sheepfolds, and, and, and knowing the passage that we're studying this morning, um, he was really excited to see how the, the, the sheepfold worked, and so they got a shepherd, and, and he brought in the sheep, and, and, and the shepherd told him, he was very proud of his sheepfold, how nothing was going to get through, you know, um, the, the sheepfold's walls. He had made them so well. And then Dr. Smith asked him, well, I see that. You did a good job making the walls, but there's no door. What's going to stop the sheep from getting out? What's going to stop predators from getting in? And the shepherd said, I am the door. When, when the sheep are inside, I make my bed across the opening, and nothing can get in or out without it going over or through me, and I'll keep them safe. Isn't that interesting? And when Dr. Smith heard that, he knew exactly what Jesus was talking about in our passage we're reading this morning. And Jesus is saying here that he is the living door. If you're going to get into the sheepfold, if you're going to be 
become a child of God, if, if you want to get to heaven, you have to go through him. He's the only way. And God makes no allowance for any other ways. He makes no allowance for other messiahs or other religious systems. Now, we need to slow down here. I need to ask you a question. I need you to think about this at least. Either Jesus is right about this or he's wrong about this. Think about it. He's either right or he's wrong. There, there's no in-between. We can't just say, well, you know, Jesus was a really good teacher. He was an amazing prophet. He was a, a, an enlightened individual. You can't say that with Jesus making claims like this. He just wasn't another dude, or maybe he was, but if he was another dude, then he couldn't make these claims. You know, either Jesus is right or he's wrong about this. Either he is the only way to God or there are other ways to God. And you have to decide, are you going to believe Jesus or are you going to reject what he is saying here? And Jesus is saying, he's the only way. It's a big deal. And if Jesus is right, then verse 10 is of utmost importance. Listen carefully to what he says. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Now, I, I, I find it's interesting that Jesus didn't say, I have come that you might have religion to the max, or that you might have enlightenment, or that you might have, as I've heard some say, a God consciousness. <laughs> okay? That's not what Jesus said. He said he came to give us life, and to give us that life more abundantly, right? And, and that's the issue, isn't it? That's what you want. That's what we want. We want new life. We, we want eternal life. We, we want abundant life. That's what everyone is looking for, if you can get them to be honest. Now, the world will say, well, all you need to do is you need to buy into our system. You need to climb uh, our ladder. You need to be financially and socially acceptable and successful and, 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 and have lots of friends and lots of money and just own all the stuff because when you get to the top, psh, then you have life. Then you have life abundantly. Hmm. Is that true? Well, does the career ladder equal more life? I've talked to people who have climbed the career ladder, and that's not what they said. Does more stuff equal more life? No, it doesn't. Does a vibrant social life equal more life? I know teenagers are so concerned with their social life. Does everyone like me? Does that mean you have more life? No. Now, there are plenty of people out there that have all the world can offer them. And are they fulfilled? Are they happy? Uh, do they have life? Of course, you guys are answering it. No, they, they, they don't. Um, they're, in fact, they're actually quite miserable. They're quite stressed out. They're quite unfulfilled. And Jesus says, I have come to give you abundant life. So doesn't it sometimes make you feel like, boy, I'm an idiot? for buying into the world system and chasing all these other things instead of listening to God's word, why he came. It's amazing, isn't it? Next, Jesus says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for a sheep. You see, Jesus could give his life for the sheep because he is the good shepherd, right? We talked about this. He would provide himself as a substitutionary sacrifice for his sheep. Now, if we translated verse 11 from the original Greek to English, we'll see that Jesus is using two definite articles here. So he's using the word the. So verse 11 directly translated, uh, and I don't know, how many of you guys speak two languages? It, when you translate stuff, it, it doesn't always translate the whole meaning. I'm not saying that our version is inferior. It's just you, sometimes you miss a little bit of uh, what's going on there, the context maybe. And so, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but it's interesting to see if you translated it word for word from the Greek, what it says. What it would translate, verse 11, would sound like this. I am the shepherd, or the shepherd, the good one who gives his life for the sheep. So it's a little bit different way of looking at it, right? It's emphasizing who he is. Um, and then the word that Jesus uses for good 
uh, is not the more commonly used word um, that is used in Greek for good. Um, that word that they normally use would be the word agathos, and that's the normal word for good. And, and that would mean that you're a moral person. My, my professor at um, Purdue University, where I graduated, I was a TA for her. She's the most moral, ethical person I ever met. She, she was an agathos person. Um, she's not a believer. I witnessed her, tried to get her to accept Christ as her Savior. But she's agathos. She's a good person. I love that lady. Um, amazing lady. All right? Agathos. But that's not the word that, they, that Jesus uses here. Um, he, but the word he uses is the word kalos. Kalos, which means authentic, genuine, or true. So if you think about it, that's exactly what's being portrayed in Psalm 23, right? He's the authentic. He's the genuine. He is the true shepherd. Uh, the, the role of the shepherd was to make sheep to lie down in green pastures, to, to lead them beside quiet waters, to restore their souls, to, to guide them in the paths of righteousness. That's what the true shepherd does. And that's what Jesus is claiming to do here. He is the authentic shepherd. He is the genuine shepherd. He is the true shepherd. And we mustn't forget that. We mustn't follow the world's standards and what the world's shepherds say we should be doing. You will not be satisfied with life. All right, let's move on to the next couple of verses. Now, remember, in verses 1 to 10, Jesus compared the religious leaders to um, false messiahs and, and the false messiahs to thieves and robbers, right? Well, here in verses 12 and 13, Jesus changes the illustration where the religious leaders are referred to as a hireling, okay? So let's read verses 12 and 13. It says there, But a hireling, he is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. So hireling, what are they? Well, they're not real shepherds. They, they, they don't have ownership of the sheep. Ultimately, they don't care about the sheep. What they really are trying to do is what can they get from the sheep? They're not doing anything for the sheep. They just want to get what they can get from the sheep, right? And they're kind of self-centered. And that's why when the wolf comes, they flee. When danger comes, they're out of there. Uh, the last thing that a hireling is going to do is he's going to give his life for the sheep. But that's not so for the good shepherd. In verses 14 and 15, Jesus tells us, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep and am known by my own, and the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I do what? I lay down my life for the sheep. So, so the good shepherd, he, he knows the sheep, he cares for his sheep, and he's willing to sacrifice his life for the sheep. And, and this is the huge dividing line between Jesus and every other religious group and every other religious cult leader you'll ever f hear about in history and to come. It's the one dividing line, well, one of many, but it's the big one. Um, religion and their leaders, they always, always, always focus on what the sheep have to do for themselves to be saved. Sheep, you have to do this if you want to get to heaven, is what they'll say, or some variation of that. Every single one of them, you have to do something. You have to do something. And the religious leaders and the religions, they, they can't save you. But Jesus did the exact opposite, right? He left heaven. He came to earth to lose his life for, for, for our sakes, so that we might be able to be saved. Jesus did it all. We sing that song, right? He did it all. We don't have to do anything. We just have to believe in him. It's by faith alone. All these other religions, even in Jesus' day, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, you gotta keep this law, you gotta do that. No, Jesus did it all. Notice that what it says in verse 11. Jesus gave his life for his sheep. It's the same thing in verse 15. I, Jesus, lay down my life for the sheep. In both verse 11 and 15, the Greek word translated for for is the Greek word hooper, and it means instead of, in the place of, for the sake of. In other words, Jesus died in our place. He died the death that our sins deserved. He went to the cross, and he took upon him my sin and your sin, and he actually bore that sin in his body, and the wrath and judgment that our sin deserved, he took on himself. 
2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 tells us, For God made him, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Is, is it becoming clear to you how stinking obvious it is that these other religions and cults, how messed up they are? How they tell us that we have to do things to get to heaven? Jesus did it all. It, it, it was the laying down of his life that made our salvation possible. Nothing that we did. I don't know of any religious leader or religious group that can make that claim. And I, and I, I don't know of one because there none exists. You will not find one religious leader that can take it upon themselves to take our sin, to take the judgment that we deserve. They wouldn't even be able to anyway because they don't qualify. They can't walk through the door. They aren't righteous and without sin. They are sinners themselves just like you and I. And, and this is why Jesus can say that he is the only uh, door to God. And that's why Jesus can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And that's why Peter could say in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Sorry, Mary, you're out. And anybody else. It's only Jesus. There's only one who laid down his life for the sheep. There's only one who was qualified to lay down his life for a sheep, and that is the good shepherd. And when we say good shepherd, we're talking about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Well, that being said, so how do we respond to all of this? Um, as the sheep of his pasture, what are we supposed to do? Well, let me give you three things, three things that the good shepherd expects from his sheep, and then we'll be done. First, the true shepherd, uh, sorry, the true sheep will listen to the shepherd's voice. And we find that in verses 4 and verse 27, right? See, hearing the voice of the shepherd is absolutely critical for the sheep's survival, and it's critical for our survival as well. We got to hear it. We need to be listening in. We need to be tuning in to the voice of Jesus. And how do we hear the voice of Jesus? By reading the word of God. Jesus, God, speaks to us through his word. And to be honest, we've really made this a lot harder than what it needs to be. We think that hearing God's voice is some airy-fairy, sensational, mystical thing. Come on. No, that wasn't it. Uh, no. No. God's word is sufficient. He's given it to us. You need to read it. And the Holy Spirit will work through his word and teach you and strengthen you. It's so important. Uh, we can open God's word at any time, and God will speak to you through his word. <laughs> Secondly, the good shepherd expects his sheep to know him, to know him. He says in verse 14, I know my own, and my own know me. So Jesus, our good shepherd, wants you to know him as well. You know, we always talk about God's knowledge of us. And it is cool, right? Uh, he, we talk about how God knows every hair on our head. Uh, I'm not going to make any comments. Uh, he talks about how God knows... <laughs> I couldn't help it. I could, that's so mean. I am not a nice person. That was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. But I noticed how fast you guys laughed. That is not good. <laughs> you should be upset. All right, anyway. But... But we like to get excited about how God knows the ha how many hairs we have on our head. We like to know, uh, we like to talk about how God knows the desires of our heart, and he does. And we like to talk about how God knows our sleeping and our waking and our sitting up and our lying down. We love to talk about that, and it is wonderful. But there, there's another side to this coin, and that is that God wants us to know him. He knows us, but he wants us to know him. Uh, he wants to have a personal relationship with him. I pray this for my children every day. That they wouldn't just go to church because it makes mommy and daddy happy. They go to church because they want to be with God's people, the church, and they want to know him better because they have a personal relationship with him and they want to work on it, all right, so they can know him better. It's a two-way street. God wants us to know the desires of his heart. God wants us to know his will 
for our lives. God wants us to, to know the height and the length and the depth of his love. And God wants us to plumb the depths of his knowledge and his wisdom, right? That's what he wants us to be doing. That there's so much that God wants us to know about him because he knows it will be a benefit to us. Thirdly, the good shepherd wants his sheep to follow him. And Jesus says that when he brings out his sheep, he goes before them, right? And they, and they follow him. And, and, and this might seem like a no-brainer to believers, to Christians, right? Um, but the reality is most Christians don't want to follow Jesus. Uh, it sounds weird, right? Uh, th- what, what Christians want to do is they want Jesus to follow them. Um, they want Jesus to go where they go. They want Jesus to bless what they're doing. They want Jesus to give his nod of approval for the plans that they have for their lives. Now, I'll be honest, I'm preaching to myself right now. I struggle with this one, right? We think that with our plan and God's blessing, we're going to go a long way. But the fact of the matter is, being a Christian is about one thing. Christian, I follow Christ. Isn't that weird how we kind of lose sight of that? We need to be a follower of Jesus. That means he leads, I follow. He speaks, I obey. And that's why Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. It's not complicated. But our flesh wars against it, doesn't it? It's the daily battle. That's okay. God understands. Just ask him to forgive you and try again the next day. It's as simple as that. So let me ask you this morning, are you following Jesus? If you're a Christian, are you really following him? Sometimes I have to check myself. Mm, maybe not today. I was getting a bit full of myself today. Where, where are you? Oh, Lord, you're over there. Psh, how did I get over here? Okay, I'm coming. Your will is better than mine. And you're listening? Are, is your listening producing knowledge? And in, in your knowledge, are you, are you learning how to follow him even better? We need to know the Lord. He wants us to know him. It's what's best for us. We're his children. All right. What I'd like you to do is, I, I guess you guys do this kind of stuff, but would you stand with me and, and turn in your Bibles to Psalm 23? And we're going to try our best. Well, I know you have different versions, but um, I'm gonna, I think I'm reading from the King James Version. Uh, uh, just kind of follow along or read along with me. And we're going to just read Psalm 23 in closing. I really feel like it's a fitting psalm just to kind of encapsulate everything we've talked about this morning. Psalm 23, let's read it together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? Amen. Pastor, thank you, sir. 